Hey, before you sit down, one of the things I love about Pastor Emmy is he got a, he's got a little bit of flow to him. He can he can rap, he can rhyme a little bit. And so I thought this is a big no way. It's a big ask, but I thought we could put him on the spot maybe. No. No. To see if he's got anything. Now, this is a you know, last minute request. So he may not, but we're going to give him a shot. <laughs> Trey's going to give us a beat. Trey, give us something, a little hip, a little rap, a little <laughs> These guys are funny. Let's see. Let's go ahead. Give us something. Let's see what we got. Something. You want it faster, slower? How's that? Nah, hit it, stop, stop, stop. <laughs> Off the top. No, 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 we won't do that. No, no, no acapella. I did this before, but I'll do it again because it'll make you think. Hey, yo, why are we so superficial? Why be a carbon copy of another? Why be artificial? Why is dealing with pain so hard? It's designed like that, homeboy, so we depend on God. Why you only see all my wrongs? Why when you look in the same mirror, you don't sing that song? Why no Bible's in public school, but you gave me one in prison? Isn't that late? Man, I'm confused. Why do we need all brand names? Why do my feet feel insecure unless I rock King James? Why you not comfortable in your skin? Why I gotta look like you, him, or Kardashian? Why can't young people change the world? Why is leadership biased? Step aside, man. Where are my girls? Hey, yo, why can't be a pastor and keep my swag? Rock off-white ones in that all-white jag. <laughs> why is disconnection normal, but my phone is better? And why your nine-year-old screaming that her WAP is better? Why you after that bag trying to gain a million, but at the end you know Benjamin more than you know your children? Why is it easy to smash and then and why you mad at your pop, but you did what he did? And why did Kobe, and why did Kobe have to take that flight? Why did my man Bruce Gordet go out that night and take his bite? Why did coronavirus hit so hard? Why under pressure we trust politicians instead of trusting God? Should I keep going? Whatever you want to do. Hey, yo, why kill each other? Why kill everybody in the room instead of the elephant? Intelligent pastor drippy with hood etiquette. Why you got an opinion? Yeah, let's keep going. Because why you got an opinion but never walked in my shoes? And when my time is buzzing, you trying to hit my snooze. Why, 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 why was Judge Brinkley biased and hating on Meek? Who be judging these judges when you can't even speak? Why judge those in the hood? Oh yeah, you never been there. They need a hand up, not a hand out, but you never lived there. Oh yeah, let's go, let's go. I'm gonna end it right here. Why is music influential more than our own law? So should we change a lyric instead of a new law? And why all the prisons we live in are prisons self-created? In Christ I kept the keys, I'm never incarcerated. I'm done, let's go. Come on, give it up for Pastor let's Amy, let's go. go. All right, you guys can sit down. Go ahead, sit down. You got me all hyped up, acting like I'm 15 again. I'm not. Who's winning it this year, black? You gotta get that banner. Who's winning this, red? Red this year? Is blue winning it this year? Let's go, let's go, let's go. Is green about to make it happen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Sit your hyper-energetic self down, and let's look at this. How many people, I'm gonna get right into this. I'm already prayed up, been waiting for you this whole time. How many people love history or, or hate? Let's, let's take a little poll. How many people uh, love history? Wow, that was more hands than I expected. How, how many people hate history? You can be honest, but with me, you better be honest. <laughs> yeah, how many people hate it? Listen, I'm gonna be real with you. I, growing up, I hated history. Hated it so much. And this is, real, this is a real story. Hated it so much that I fought my history teacher. <laughs> yeah, look at, the, look at the person next to you and say, don't do that. Say, 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 you are not that guy, pal. You are not that guy. <laughs>
Yeah, look at the other person you didn't look at and say, but I am that guy. But I, no, 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 I'm only playing. I used to, I used to have this, uh, this history teacher named Mr. Schaub, and I was raised in the Bronx, CIS 147. And this guy used to belittle us and make fun of us because we were on welfare, et cetera. I got so frustrated about a handful of things. Not only did I hate him, but I hated Miss, uh, history as well. Ended up with a fight in him, and I didn't get suspended, needless to say. But as I got older, even though I initially started hating history, it got to the place in my life where I started to recognize the power of history and how important history was, that if we didn't address history, we would repeat it. Listen to me, young people. Sometimes you can hate the things around you and then become the very thing around you. So you have to be willing to look at the stories that are associated with history. Do me a favor and put that word history on, on the screen. I want you to see this word history. In the word history, I want you to see the word story. Yeah, that every person in this room, you have a story that's associated with your life. But as we look backwards, there's a history that contributed to your story. So every time you look back, there's a history there. You have one. I have one. You have one. But if we allow God and we allow the Lord to really get involved in the details of our story, not only does he take the history and possibly redeem it for some of us, but he takes the story and the history, and then that same story becomes his story. History becomes his story. Your story and your history becomes the story that God wants to lose. History is affecting your story. Your story, as it goes through changes and evolutions and God begins to touch it, becomes the very story that he wants to use. It becomes his story. And then over time, we find ourselves leaving a legacy where we are. I want you to know how important you are. Your parents were important, and they are and they play a role in shaping you, but ultimately, you're gonna continue with the baton of stories. The story, what kind of story? This is what I want you to think, for those of you who are taking out notes. Write down, what kind of story am I writing in my life right now? Because I'm about to leave that behind. The name of my message today is called, My Story is His Story. Yes, it's history, but my story is his story. My story is his story. Say that with me, say, my story, my story. is his story. Yes, it's history. Yes, it's yesterday. Yes, it's associated with all that, but my story is a tie to it. So I want you to know that when it comes to stories, stories are the oldest form of entertainment. Who doesn't like a good story? Yeah, a book, a good, a good cinema. As a matter of fact, cinema presentation becomes what we would call like state-of-the-art technology. But when it comes to stories, your stories is what God would call state-of-the-heart technology that God begins to use your story to reach other people and, and, and to make an impact in their lives. Information alone rarely moves people into actions, but stories are associated with emotional uh, 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 triggers, if you will, emotional transportation that allows people to go along your journey as you tell your story. A few points for you as I go through this. Everyone has a story, listen to me, and if you don't own and share that story, your personal story will get lost in life. The enemy would love nothing more than make you feel like you have nothing to, to offer. And I want you to know that that is an absolute lie. This is what leads to comparison issues. Most people are so embarrassed and they deal with whether it's trauma or shame or some kind of guilt of people that they are around and associated with that, uh, that is beyond their control that we so despise our history instead of realizing that God can redeem what you don't like and heal what's broken and fix whatever's crooked. He can address all of that, but when we don't deal with that and own the story, we start comparing, I wish my life was like yours. I wish I had her butt. <laughs> you don't, you got your own. <laughs> yes, sir. And, and you got to be able to embrace everything that makes an impact in your life. Do not let the enemy keep you silent in regards to your own story. And I also want you to know that if you are discontent in any capacity about how your story looks, there's good news. God is a story changer. Yeah, God is into transforming stories. I want you to know that your Bible is not this religious manual like some people will make it out to be. It's actually story-driven. It's like it's not clinical. It's not like, like that. It's story-driven, and it's awesomely honest about the lives of people's stories. 
And I want you to be awesomely honest. Look at this verse in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. It says, but you are the ones that are chosen by God. Somebody say, I'm chosen. Chosen for the high calling of priestly work. Chosen to be a holy people. God's instruments to do his work and to speak out for him. To tell others of the night and day difference he made for you. From nothing to something. From rejected to accepted. <laughs> I get excited about when I read the Bible. Man, listen, God wants to use you and the story that is associated with you. Now, this next point that I'm going to give you, I want you to jot it down because I'm going to highlight it like four or five times in today's message. But God has never made a person that he didn't love and he never made a story that he couldn't use. I want to say it again for my people in the back. God has never made a person that he didn't love, and he never made a story that he could not use. My story is his story. And yes, my story is tied to history. Some of you may know some of the details. I wanted to share my message, but I also wanted to include my family in this story because my son is roughly a lot of your ages that are here. And I want, I want you to be able to see how God can take a story that comes from a lot of, 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 of issues and traumas and and junk and curses in the background of their lives and begin to heal them. And I'm stuck in between my history and the legacy that I'm trying, well, God trying to use my story. And I'm in a season now where I get to look back and show you some of the history, share my story, but also how I'm making it God's story because ultimately God's story becomes the legacy that I'm going to leave in my own people. And that story will remain in, alive in the future. You are carrying someone's story while you're developing your own story. Ah, let, 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 let. Point number one, point number one, number one. You have a real story, and that story is tied to a real history. Remember this. This is so important. You have a real story, and that story is tied. You, do you know that? as I deal with so many people and talk to people, whether they're younger or older, that most people are comfortable telling someone else's story than telling their own. That we're busy chasing what other people are posting online because we're not content with our own story, so we would rather cover our lives with someone else's story. And, and that's what I don't want you to do. I want you to get to the place where you could be honest and say, man, I may not like all that my history looks like, but God can heal that and heal me as I continue to move forward. But I can't live in denial of the fact that my mom might be on drugs and I can't do anything about that. I was born into this story. But in order for God to heal that, I got to own that. Yeah, 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 yeah. My mind is running. Are you getting anything out of this? In order for God to do amazing things in your life, you have to acknowledge all of your story. In John chapter 8, Jesus said this about, about the truth. He says, to the Jews who had believed in him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teachings, you are really my disciples. Look at this. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. I believe that that's not just truth, like God's Bible truth. I believe that because God is the author of all truth, you have to be willing to tell your truth even if it's painful. Like you have, in order for God, in other words, let me say it this way, God can't heal anything you lie about in your life. Yeah, in order for God to get involved, he has to get involved with your willingness to bring him involved, but you have to be honest about that part of your story. Every story in this room right now matters, and every story can be redeemed, but first, every story must be acknowledged. You have to be willing to look at it and say, wow, I had nothing to do with this. I don't like this. I might be discontent with that. I'm not, I, I really don't like that that takes place. But even though there are certain parts that you are uh, content about and certain parts that you are discontent about, God can still heal the story, redeem the story, and continue to use the story. Because check this out, you're not working with a different story. No, 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 y your friends may have both parents, but you don't, that's your story. And you have to own that so that God can begin to work in that. And while they have a story that God will use, God will still use your story despite the variables. You have to embrace it. You have to embrace all. And let me tell you why. When you don't and it bothers you so deeply where it might produce some kind of guilt, maybe some shame, we'll lie to cover it and come up with a new narrative and you will potentially live a lie because you can't own your truth. And that's what, I, listen, I see this happen so much. 
so much in people, and I don't want that to happen. Do you know that when you search your Bible and you go through it, that God, most often than not, is trying to reach you when you, you are at your youngest stages? When you look at in your Bible, David, God spoke to David's life through a prophet when he was around 15 years old. He didn't wait for him to turn 30 to talk to him. God is speaking to you right now. Speaking to you through Parker last night, Pastor Parker last night, speaking to you through me, speaking to you through anybody that's in and around here trying to get your attention so that you wake up and allow that antenna to reach and connect to heaven because you matter to him even though you might be 10, 12, 14, 16. God spoke to David at 15 years old. He didn't wear the crown until he turned like 30, but God needed to speak to him so he could prepare him before he turned 30. God spoke to Joseph literally when he was 17. Where are my 17-year-olds in the house? Anywhere around? Listen, God is speaking to you even right now. God spoke to Jeremiah when he was 15. And look at what he told Jeremiah, and he's saying the same thing to you. The word of the Lord came to me saying, before I formed you, Jeremiah, before I formed you, Sharon, before I formed you, Jerry, before I formed you, Mark, before I formed you, in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. I knew your story before you knew your story, and I want to redeem your story and use your story. I'm going to use you. Did you know that when I was raised, my father was not in my life. My father was incarcerated. Put a picture of my father on there. I just, I, my father, that's, that's my dad. I just, listen to me. I just, I'm in my 40s. He just reached out to me after doing like 40 years in prison. And, and I felt like God told me, let him in your heart. Don't close the door because I'll continue to heal the parts of your story that you've been uh, struggling with, the painful part. This is a brand new relationship. Some of you, you've had your fathers your whole life. I am just starting this journey with him right now, but I'm allowing God in. My, my, another part of my story, put a picture of my mom up there. My mom was 15 years old when she had me. Where are my 15 year olds? Imagine having a baby at that age, it's crazy. And then as a parent trying to have a child, you are a child, raising a child. And how many people know if children raise children, they grow up childish? So, but, but, but this is my story, this is what I'm working with, I can't change this. And I can't hate them for things that I was born into. I gotta recognize that this is part of my story. Do you know that when I, it got to the place in my life that I refused to tell myself the truth, when my dad was not around in my life, I got to the place where I was so angry with him and so bitter and so upset, and I wouldn't acknowledge it that one day my stepdad, who was, who was African American growing up, and he said to me, hey son, and he called me son. Man, listen, when he said that, my heart had been dealing with so much pain of feeling rejected and feeling abandoned by my real father and not being there that I eventually embraced. Hear me out, hear me out, hear me out, because I know there's a lot of variations with this, but I'm, the whole point I'm saying this is because I want you to get to the place where you can tell yourself the truth in your life. It got to the place that I wanted a dad so bad that I embraced this stepdad in my life. And I called, not only, it's okay to call him dad, I, st I told people though, this is where I begin to lie to myself. If I put a picture of my man up there. This man raised me for a, a large portion of my life. It's the newest picture that I sent. The man on the right, I'll leave his name out, but he raised me. He's my stepdad, but he's African American. And I told people for the least 13 years of my life, I was black and Puerto Rican. That wasn't true. For 13 years, I lied to myself because I couldn't admit the pain in my story, that my real father was not there, he was incarcerated, it was embarrassing to address that, and so I will embrace anything and say anything, even if it meant lying to myself, but God can't get involved to begin healing when you're living a lie. So we gotta get to the place that we start on the premise of this hurts, I don't like the scenario. It may be different than what my cousin looks like. It might be different than what my friend looks like. It might be different than most of the kids at school. But for me, I got to get to the place. And I remember leaving high school. I was, uh, uh, no, it was, it, was, it was eighth grade. And I was leaving school one day. And I remember saying, man, my mom is Puerto Rican. My father's Puerto Rican. I got to stop lying to myself. And that's why to this day you hear me say, somebody say, preach Puerto Rican. And that's me just owning that aspect of my life, and I have to own it. Once again, God has never made a person that he didn't love, and he never made a story that he couldn't use. Point number two, 
Your story will have parts that need redemption. Will you let God get involved to heal the areas that no one else possibly can? This is the area of our lives that as the story begins to change and evolve, I'm talking about you growing. You can't change yesterday. The history that you was born into is what you're just born into. Now, will you let God get involved in the story to bring a level of change, a level of transformation, a level of healing in your life? Because if they could have given it to you, it's possible that they would have, but they couldn't because they're still growing in your face. And now you got to trust God to get involved in your own story. Everything in my story wasn't 100% Gucci. <laughs> it wasn't. Change was necessary and it was continual. So I don't want you to be so wounded by the negative parts of your story that that stops you from wanting to be better. All our lives, especially as we, we, we were younger, I wanted to fit in so many places, being rejected by so many people that I, I wanted to be loved by. And all of a sudden, as I, as I try to fit into this group, I felt rejected. And as I try to fit into this group, and I kept feeling like I was a misfit, and I did not fit. And I began to discover later on in life that the reason why I felt like a misfit is because I really didn't fit because God had marked my life and if I would have fit with them I would have fell out with God but the reason why I didn't fit in with them is because God was trying to push me closer to him and then eventually I would be incarcerated at a very young age 16 and a half and they sentenced me to 15 years in jail it's crazy but that's when I met the Lord and I began to fit in with him and he put a mark on my life and I didn't even realize that I was gonna be called to do all that I was doing, but I was letting him involved in the story because many components of my story needed redemption. So in it, David says this in Psalm 119, verse 33. He says, God, teach me lessons for living so I can stay the course. Your life has life lessons that you're learning right now. Digest them, learn from them. David understood this principle. I have life lessons, Lord. Teach me lessons for living so I can keep on moving forward. Because if you're not learning through the lessons, you might get bitter through the lessons and may not look at it as a lesson. Then you might internalize that as a problem. Then you'll give up on God and hate everything that's good when it could be working to help you out. And sometimes we can learn not just from other people, but we can also learn, uh, uh, we can learn through our own pain, that might be true, but sometimes you can learn from people like me. How many people know it's a whole lot easier to let somebody else mess up and then you learn from that mistake? But like, yeah, bro, I'm not gonna do that. Did you see what happened when he did that? And that's what I want you to do. I want you to adopt and to learn things from other people, including my own story. God doesn't waste pain. Let's let God use this story right now that's tied to my history, that was evolved in my own story, and allow it to be his story, and we can put it on blast right now and allow everyone to see it so we can say, what can we learn from all that God brought Pastor Emmy through so that we can avoid making those mistakes? And while it is smart to learn from experiences, it's smarter to learn from the experiences of other people. There isn't enough time to learn everything in life through trial and error. In Proverbs chapter 25, look at what your Bible says, verse 12. It says, a warning given by an experienced person to someone willing to listen is more valuable than gold rings or jewelry made of the finest gold. Oh, yeah, somebody say, I'm willing to listen. Yeah, we're going to hit you like Pastor Wayne real quick, hit you with the wave. <laughs> yeah, put, put the picture up real quick of, of me being baptized. I got baptized. God was working. My point is, look at, your boy had real gold in his mouth. <laughs> yeah, when I was in, yeah, never mind. So, so that's me. God, God is working through my story. I got saved in prison as a young boy. I think I was about 18 in that age right there. I got water baptized, spirit baptized. Most of my significant spiritual encounters came through the darkest moments of my life. And God still shows up in the cave. God still shows up when mama's not around. When daddy's inebriated, God still shows up. God shows up when all hell breaks loose. God shows up when other people are abandoned and other people are not there. God is still there in the process, even though it looks like no one is there, he's still there in the process. I was letting him redeem my life during that season. This is a picture of me and my wife before we got married, and she was coming down, thank you, Lord, for faithfulness. And yeah, look at your boy with the mane. I just bumped into somebody in the bathroom. He had a long braid, just, just multiple braids. Like, who tied your hair up like that? 
I used to get my head tied up like, oh, this is God working with me in that season. Everything was changing externally, internally, my heart, my soul. And remember, God has never made a person that he didn't love, and he never made a story that he couldn't use. Somebody say, Lord, use my story. Number three, number three, number three, number three. Your story is now his story. It's not just history. We know that God is trying to redeem the past. So I don't want you to quit even though you might come from something ugly. And everybody has pain. I don't care who you are. We got to stop comparing pain. If it hurts, it hurts. My son was running up the stairs one day and he hit his knee on the, on the banister. And he says, oh, and he fell on the floor. I said, oh boy, be quiet. That, that didn't hurt. He said, dad, it's not your leg. And because it didn't affect me personally, I felt like it shouldn't hurt. But it affected him on a different level, and so for him it hurt. And sometimes we'll say, oh, you didn't go through anything, and we have a tendency of minimizing people's experiences. And that's why I wrote in that bar, we got to stop judging people in the hood when you ain't been there. We, we got to understand pain is pain. And we got to stop judging people on the flip side, living in the suburbs, and just because you don't live there doesn't mean that they don't have pain. Everybody has a real life with a real story. God wants to redeem it no matter where you are. He's never made a person that he hasn't loved, and he never allowed you to have the story if he couldn't use it. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 8, look at this. Your lives are echoing the master's word. Not only in the provinces, but, but all over the place. The province is a city. Not, all, not only in this, these cities in Memphis and all these other places, but all over the place. Look at this. Your, the news of your faith is out. We don't even have to say anything anymore. You're the message. You're the message. All the way in the back, sorry, right there, you're the message. Young man right there, you're the message. All my red people, you're the message. All the way up there in the black, you're the message. Your life is the message that God wants to use. Your history is a part of your life. We have to embrace it. No more lying about yesterday. But God starts to evolve it in, a temp in, the, in your real life, which is story. But then ultimately, what are we going to do with this story? God says, I want to use it. I want to use it to show people how I can take you from wherever you come from and whatever has happened and whatever you've done and whatever, whoever you did it with, I can still heal, deliver, set free, and then use the very story that you don't have to hide. This is why the book says that we overcame the enemy by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. Oh. The, just, just, the picture with me and the wife and the family on the couch. Just, I just want you to see, this is now, this is, like, this is during COVID. I got the privilege of raising these people and telling them about my story and saying, this is what we're trying to do. We're trying to break curses. You didn't come from where I came from, but my story does affect you. And, my, and I have placed some things in you that were good, and sometimes unconsciously, I've done some things that you saw that were not good, and I need you to pick up where I left off. Like, I love my family, and I love what God is doing in this new season. Who would have thought that God could took, take this Puerto Rican kid from the Bronx, from all of this trauma, incarceration, pain, abuses, molestations, all of that, and then use me to be a pastor and now take it and make it his story? Like, my face doesn't even belong to me. My face belongs to God. Put the picture of me preaching at Excel. We're becoming, and so God is just using us. Now, this was, this was before COVID, and I just, yeah, because, you know, post-COVID, things look a little different now. <laughs> but, but God is just using, my point is, my point is, is that God is using the story, y'all. No matter where you are, he's using the story. And remember, God has never made a person that he didn't love, and he's never made a story that he couldn't use. And then my last point, your story will become History. I don't mean just his story anymore, and I don't mean just what you came from in the past. I mean your story is now going to be history. What kind of story are you writing? Do you do know that you can determine right now what kind of story you're going to leave behind by decisions you make today? What kind of story are you writing? Oh, don't get it twisted. Don't get lost in life where people start, oh, that doesn't matter. Let's go do this, girl. Oh, that doesn't matter. Come on, man. Let's just go do this. And you know that what they're encouraging you to do is absolutely wrong. Well, you are writing a story and leaving a story. We call it legacy. What are we leaving? And remember this about legacy. Legacy is not just what you leave in their hands. Legacy, more importantly, is what you leave in people's hearts. 
What am I putting on the inside of you that you're going to carry on after I'm gone? You're leaving the history. Where's my son at? Evan, come out here real quick. My man, Evan, just graduated from high school. He just turned eight. It was his birthday last week. This is my boy, 50 grand. He, he had a story that he shared with me that I thought was so important. And I said, can you share that? So do, do me a favor, homeboy. Just, just pick up from wherever I, I'm talking and, and just share your little story about, about legacy real quick. Or rather, the story. Because then, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. He knows I'm going to interrupt him like this. For years, as this man was growing and God knew I would be a pastor, I'm a first generation pastor. I didn't know that becoming a pastor and then God using you in a successful way that my kids would get lost in my story and not know their own. I didn't know that every time I encouraged him to go to a small group, he didn't want to go because they would ask him more questions about me and so he felt like he could never be seen because every time they seen him, they just cared about me. And I begin to realize, yo, my story is still relevant. I cannot be me because this is happening to them, but then I cannot protect them because they have a story that's their own story, but it's still tied to their history, which is me. Pick up, pick up, pick up, pick up. Okay, we all we hop straight into it. Just, just do your thing. All right, cool. So um, my dad's a sneakerhead, if you didn't notice, is just, you know what I'm saying? He said, it's what they leave in your heart, also what you leave in your hands. I'm a sneakerhead as well. He's a sneakerhead, this is what we do. Uh, but in... I was around like seventh grade. My foot was like a size like seven, seven and a half. He's a size 10 and a half, 11. And I remember I put my foot in his shoe one day and I was like, yeah. He's like, boy, take him out. What you doing? Take them off, put them back in the box. You're going to crease them. You don't know what you're doing. And then I was Come going, on, you know you can't put a small foot in a big shoe because you're going to bend talk, the toe box up and talk. crease it all up. Be creasing my shoes up. Pick up, go. And I... Uh, I, my foot was rapidly growing at this time, and I remember it was like two months later, uh -huh. um, and I was like a nine, nine and a half again, put my foot back in his, boom. What you doing, boy? Take them shoes off. What you mean? You're going to crease them. Don't, don't do anything. And I remember I got to the point where I was a size 10, and I put my foot in that shoe. He was feeling a little hopeful then. Yo. I put him, bow. He's like, you are not that guy, pal. Take him, yeah, what you, you doing? Put him back in the pal. box. You. You don't know what you're doing. But then eventually I was able to convince him about like two weeks later for me to wear the shoe. And I know he was hurting inside, but he still let me do it. And then Christmas came around. And this Christmas I was hyped because he was talking to me and he was like, yo, you can pick three pairs. And I was like, yo, I'm gonna pick them three pairs I had my eye on. And I remember I picked three pairs from his collection. This is one of them and I wore them to the ground, yo. I wore them and I wore them and I wore them. But eventually it got to the point where I realized that I was walking in his shoes and my appetite grew and I had to get my own and buy my and you own. grew out of my shoe size yeah I grew out of your shoe size but it's like a 12 now some crazy like that some <laughs> some mammoth size foot but, but but my point is my point is that I was not only walking in his physical shoes but I was taking his story and walking in it as well and I would sit there and I'd tell his story as if it was mine sometimes because mm. I was so ashamed of what I haven't been through this homeschooled past this kid, half white, half Puerto Rican, don't know how to own myself because of something that I haven't gone through. For some reason, we love to Go. compare pain and compare trauma. Go. And I look at you and I see what you have gone through, but I see what I haven't gone through. Go. And all of a sudden, I feel discredited because of something that I haven't gone through. And now I have to pick up and now I have to feel like I have to go through wrong to yeah. be used. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes, I, yo, you have to, we, we have this weird distorted view where in order for somebody to be effective, their story has to be extreme. Yeah. And my story has to be extreme for me to be effective. It's not true. No, it's not true. And you know what it's a sign of? It's a sign of us doing the work where you are a healthier version of me. Yeah. And so Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, same God yeah. running yeah. through generations. Yeah. And so here you are picking up from where I left off, picking up from where I left off, and now no longer, in, in, not in prison. When I was 17, I was in jail. You see this brother standing on this stage. He's not incarcerated, never been arrested before, never put a drug in his mouth, never put a, a syringe in his arm. He, he was never part of no gangs. And I'm saying we might be doing a pretty good job. Now I know I'm not perfect. And I know I still got things that I need to work on that I might have still placed inside of you. And so I am your history. So, so peep it, peep it. If he was perfect, I would never have to rely on his story because he would be enough. Mm. 
you would make me a god at that point. Exactly. So now this is where God comes in play because he picks up the gap where, where the people around you that you sincerely love can't give you. So we got to be merciful and super forgiving toward all the people around us that played a role. And Let's say this. Let's say this. There's three things about your story that make it sacred. Not Evan, all of you. Yeah. Number yeah. one, what makes your story sacred is your race. You were born into the world like that. No one gave you that but God. So you got to own it. You're not white enough to fit into the white group and not Puerto Rican enough because you don't even speak Spanish with a Vasquez last name. Yeah. And I know it might be difficult, but you got you to gotta own that hybrid, homeboy. Yeah. Another thing about your story that makes it sacred, and I know contrary to popular belief, but you still got to hear it. You were born into the world with a sex. Can't do anything about that. You were born. No, nobody, God gave you that. Number three, number three, you were born into this world with a set of parents that you can't change. Well, I love my parents, great, but what about the people who don't? You can't, you can't do anything about that. So the goal is to trust God to redeem what you're struggling with until the story begins to take on a new look and a new generation. Thank you. God has never made a person that he didn't love and he never made a story that he couldn't use. If you don't heal yesterday, the history, it's going to affect your today, the story, and eventually will affect tomorrow. And could God use it if you don't get the healing that you need? Yeah. So I want to pray. And I want to pray for everybody in this room right now. If you want God to touch your story, I don't know, some people, listen to me, your dad, your mom, your whoever might be, your, their name might be so big in your life and, and, and maybe they run companies, maybe they do whatever, that sometimes like my son, other people when they see you, they see your parents before they see you and you get lost in the family story. And you're like, I'm here, I have my own fingerprint, God made me different than my parents, although I have their DNA, I still have my own eye print, my own voice print, I am different, see me. And so I want to pray, if you want God to heal your story, maybe wherever it's impacting you in some negative fashion, if you don't feel like people, God sees you because of your story. If you don't feel like people see you, you're going to need healing in this area. I want you to come down here right now. I want to pray. I want to pray. Don't, don't ever feel intimidated. I want you to come up here. I want you to pray. If you ever felt like your story right now is lost in the lives of other people, I want you, I want to pray for you and I want to challenge you to come down. Come down. Come down and meet me. Meet me up here. Meet me up here. I don't know. I could have came all the way from Boston for one person. I don't know who it's for. Some people are cool with their stories, and that's wonderful. I want you to embrace it because that's the story that God gave you, and God wants to use that story. But what about the rest of us? Jacob wasn't Isaac. Isaac wasn't Abraham. But God was still connected to all of them because he's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Abraham had his own issues, and the ones that he didn't address, he passed on to Isaac. Isaac had his own issues and his own story, and the ones that he didn't address, he passed on to Jacob. And Jacob began to wrestle because they called them something that God never called them, a liar and a cheat and a conniver and a trickster. And God says, I have a better part of storytelling for you. I'm going to change your name from Jacob to Israel. I'm going to make you a prince with God. I'm going to use you on a whole nother level. Now hear me out. His whole life, his whole life, he's known as Jacob and Israel. A combination of his story and God's story. Yeah, yeah. And whenever he felt weak, he was standing in his own story. And whenever they called him Israel and he was standing in God's story, that's when you saw victory take place in his life. Let's pray right now. Worship, sing something. Father, in the name of Jesus. I pray, Lord, for all of these people right now in Jesus' name. I thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in their lives. I thank you, Lord, for healing right now in the name of Jesus. I thank you, Lord, for a fresh start. I thank you because they're going to start seeing their families through a new lens of love, understanding that you have called them and anointed them to be a part of that specific family, that family line. That daddy is my daddy, and I can't do anything about what he did, but I can help redeem what he has done through my own life. 
Father, in the name of Jesus, bring a fresh anointing on all these young people. You are in love with young people. I thank you, Lord, for the angels of the Lord that encamp around them and deliver them. Set them free in the areas that they need your healing, that they need your deliverance. I give you praise right now in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name.